dark delight, and Dharma and Big Sur, most certainly so. The, yeah, the, the sec second half of the program definitely. Um, it starts on a foggy day on the California coast, and again, it starts very, very rhapsodically and quietly, and in a sort of moodiness. Um, and then it, the light comes out, and the last. 15 minutes of the Dharma at Big Sur are just a wild stomp. Um, the piece was composed for the opening of Disney Hall in Los Angeles, this wonderful concert hall designed by Frank Gehry. And I wanted to write a piece that uh, evoked the sensation of arriving on the West Coast. I mean, I and so many people I know who live in California came there from somewhere else. And it was a kind of mythic event for each one of us, that moment when we actually encounter the Pacific and we feel that we're on the other side of the, of the land mass. And I looked around for some kind of literary inspiration and I found it in Jack Kerouac, who you know, was from Massachusetts, but he, uh, on the road, came out to California and he was very, very eloquent. Um, and I, made this title up myself, the Dharma, which of course is the Buddhist word for the truth, and Big Sur, which is this immensely powerful uh, landscape uh, about two hours south of San Francisco, um, sharp, jagged, steep cliffs that drop three, four hundred feet to the pounding surf beneath. Um, you know, it's, it's the all-time romantic landscape. And I just had this image of the poet, um, you know, the beat poet, uh, standing at the edge of the precipice, pre precipice looking out uh, at the sea, which I do. I have a, a house up on the northern Sonoma coast, and it's very close to the ocean there. And sort of receiving that spirit, spirit from the Orient and that blessedness, that Zen blessedness that, that Kerouac starts uh, to talk about. And I composed it for a very unusual instrument. I, it's, a, it's a concerto for electric violin, six strings. I wrote it for a remarkable violinist named Tracy Silverman, who you know, studied at Juilliard and could play all the concertos, but gave it all up to become uh, a free-spirited improviser. Uh, lives in Nashville now. And, uh, and then the incredible violinist, Leo Josephovitz, who has played my other violin concerto about 60 times, um, she heard the piece and said, I want to play that. And I said, well, you can't. You need this six-string violin. And she said, well, I'll get my own. And she went to London, and she took her Strat or Guarneri, whatever it is, and had the, uh, a, a violin builder in, in uh, I believe, in Birmingham, England, make measurements of her precious regular violin. And then he built her this, uh, it's a solid body instrument. It looks like an electric guitar that you hold under your chin. It doesn't have any resonating, you know, body at all. Um, it, it gets plugged into a guitar amplifier. And the idea of the piece is that it's designed a little bit like an Indian raga. It begins very quietly, very meditatively. Uh, there are lots of slides and, you know, it's very lyrical in a sort of jazzy way. And then just very gradually the rhythm starts to kick in. And after about 15 minutes, um, the rhythm just takes over, and it becomes like this big electronic gamelan just banging away in this fantastic, joyous uh, cacophony while the electric violin soars, like kind of like a, a high frequency Jimi Hendrix above the orchestra. Did you find it especially difficult at all writing for an instrument like that that you had? perhaps never seen, heard, or, well, you heard, heard it, but... Well, I, I knew that it it could basically do everything a, a regular violin could do, but uh, I have to say this was this was the first time that I ever did an absolutely genuine collaboration. You know, normally, I've written a piano concerto for Emmanuel X, but I, I wrote the concerto, and then I sent it to him, and maybe he complained about a few fingerings or something, and I fixed them, but... Uh, in this case, Tracy Silverman came to my studio, I don't know how many times, you know, maybe a half dozen or even ten times, and I would write something out and he'd try it and then, then would tweak it and he'd suggest something. And I mean, it was a real 
honest to God collaboration, uh, the sort of thing that we think happens but actually rarely does. So the piece is very much a reflection of, of his spirit. But then when Leela plays it, she brings her own extraordinary um, musical personality to the piece. So I feel very lucky to have two incredibly talented people playing this very bizarre and, and obscure instrument and, and making it fairly well known. And how has this piece been accepted? Um, well, you know, it it's not getting played as often as Bolero. Uh, no. You know, it, 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 it requires uh, an exceptionally unique artist uh, and somebody who's willing to, you know, to learn this instrument. Um, but it's been getting around, and of course I, you know, one of the good things about being a composer-conductor is that I myself can program it, like I'm doing here in Cincinnati, but, um, um, you know, Marin Alsop is doing it with Leela, and um, uh, other conductors are, are programming it, um, so, you know, we call this classical music because we, we hope it's going to live for a long time, and, you know, it, it might take a while to get off the runway. It's not like pop music where if it doesn't, you know, go with a bullet to the charts by next week, it's it's a failure. You know, we, we think of a lot of pieces like Mahler symphonies, you know. I'm old enough to remember when Mahler symphonies were a rarity uh, in on American orchestras. You heard Scheherazade, uh, you know, or Beethoven all the time, but you rarely heard anything except maybe the first or the fourth Mahler symphonies. Now, of course, you, know, you just can't get free of them. I wish they'd put Mahler symphonies in a time capsule and fire them off into space for just a little while so that we could come back and just enjoy how wonderful they are and not, you know, feel that we're oversaturated with them. Mm -hmm. The six string violin, what, what are the extra two strings? I mean, is it the GDAE? Uh, at the high end? They, they drop down, uh, let's see, they drop down a, two more fifths, so the lowest note is actually uh, almost as low as the C on the cello. Wow. So it, it's amazing, because the piece starts in the violin range, and you kind of get comfortable with it, and you know you in, are enjoying the fact that it's an, a, a very unique sound, and it's electric, and then all of a sudden it goes way down, and your hair stands up, because you think, oh... <laughs> It's a cello, uh, but then it goes way up into the violin range. It's amazing. Now, did you first hear Tracy in a in a jazz club somewhere? I heard him in uh, at Yoshi's uh, Jazz Club in Oakland, California. I think he was playing uh, with Terry Riley, the the minimalist composer, who's uh, a good friend and lives out there. And as musicians and composers are wont to do these days, if you go up and say, hey, I like your stuff, they immediately whip out a CD. <laughs> and of course, Tracy reached into his violin case and said, hey man, hey, check out my CD. So I did, I, I, I went home. Well, actually, I never listened to music at home. I, I always listened to it in the car. <laughs> so I listened to his, he made an album that has everything from Beatles songs to you know, ragas, and, and I loved it. And I called him back and I said, how would you feel about my writing a a concerto for this instrument and for you.